Welcome to the HPC Best Practices um, webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the US Department of Energy. And this series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marquez from Lawrence Berkeley, and will be the host for today's webinar, Growing Precise from an as is coupling library to a sustainable batteries included ecosystem. And the webinar will be presented by Gerasimus Churdakis. Gerasimus is a doctoral candidate at the Technical University of Munich, where he takes the leading role in organizing the development operations of the flash of the precise ecosystem. This includes adapters for virus solvers, tutorial cases, documentation, website and testing, and also shaping these components for the precise community to grow up, to grow upon. Uh, he is also researching methods for geometric multi-scale coupling and enjoys teaching topics related to research software engineering. With that, uh, Erasmus, you take control. Thank you very much, Osni. Let me share my screen. All right, now I think you can uh, see my screen. And yes, I would like today to talk about an ecosystem. And I'm talking about an ecosystem because a few years back when I and a few colleagues of mine uh, started our PhDs, we got a very uh, nice library in our hands, the core of our ecosystem today. And we built up on this. Uh, others made the core even stronger. And I worked on adding more flesh to the ecosystem. And let's have a look at what is it that we are talking about, first of all. So the motivation for a coupling library, or at least for precise, is that we want to do partitioned multi-physics simulations. A very classical example is fluid structure interaction. And in this picture, you see a famous benchmark by Turek and Kron, where you have a channel flow. So we have a CFD code. And there is an obstacle in the middle. You may know this picture where uh, the flow around the cylinder creates this Karman vortex street. And now imagine that uh, downstream, you also uh, fix a flexible flap, which will then start moving based on these uh, oscillations. Instead of solving everything in one code, we actually want to reuse the expertise of a structure solver, which we want to plug in to our flow simulation. And we can do this with precise. One alternative application, also very common, is conjugate heat transfer. Here you see a cell and tubes heat exchanger where a cold fluid and the hot fluid are exchanging heat. Special in this scenario, and one nice feature of precise, is that here you see more than two coupling participants. We have two fluids separated by solid. Okay, but let's now dive a bit deeper and try to understand what is this library. Imagine that on the one side you have flow code, let's say open form, and on the other side you have a structure code, let's say Calculix is a famous example, uh, or some other codes that I will explain in the, in the in a moment. As I said, we want to take our flow simulation and plug into it a structure simulation. We can do that by using the precise library in both the solvers that we are using. As you see, both solvers are published some standard solvers, experts on their fields. And you only need to add this precise library to make them talk. How do you do that? You essentially need to call the library. And these additional lines of code that you need to call the library, we call an adapter. In case of OpenFoam, this is a nice plugin. In other codes, this may be some additional uh, code changes directly in the code or in any other interface it may provide. 
The library itself takes care of data mapping between uh, the meshes of the two solvers, which can follow completely different discretizations. In this case, we have a finite volume mesh. In this case, a finite element mesh. All the precise nodes is a cloud of points and potentially how they are connected. The library also takes care that there is efficient uh, communication. So this can run efficiently from a laptop to a supercomputer with MPI. And uh, in addition, this library will make sure that we iterate efficiently the two sides of the simulation until we converge to the same truth on the interface. This is something we call implicit coupling. But this is a picture. How does it look in code? Now, in every code, uh, in every simulation code, you usually have a transient loop. You have uh, a solution step where you solve for your current time step size. And then you need to call precise. You need to inform precise about the new values you got on the boundary. So you fill a buffer. You write data, in this case, force, if you want to do a fluid structure interaction simulation. And then uh, you ask Precise to do its magic. You ask it to perform data mapping communication and a coupling step. And it will do that for the same time step size. In the end, it will give us a new allowed uh, time step size for the next iteration because we may need to actually synchronize again. Then, in the end, Precise will also give us new boundary values that we can read in our code. In this case, we want to read displacements. The actual code is a bit more complicated, but it boils down to this simple example. Now, if you are actually an applications engineer, if you, if you come from mechanical engineering and you want to do a multi-physics simulation and not to write code yourself, you may find that using a library may be a bit complicated for you. You may want something that you can just start running. And this is where the whole story begins. So by including ready to use adapters and examples for many of these famous solvers, uh, we have essentially created an ecosystem that people can just take components of the shelf, and in many cases, run simulations. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. If you have my slides, which uh, you can also find the link for in the chat, the slides uh, contain links. So you may see here already uh, open foam. Uh, this is a very famous code for which uh, Thomas Lovemarie also gave a talk, actually two talks about in this same webinar series. And you may also see DL2, um, for which also Wolfgang Bangert uh, also gave a talk recently. Now, if you still are a developer, you have your own code and you want to use the library as uh, always, this is something you can do. Precise is a C++ library, C++14 in particular, but uh, we now have uh, language bindings for essentially any language you may need in scientific computing. If not, please let us know, we will add it. In the process of building an ecosystem, it was very important to also build a nice website and documentation. I would like to walk you through into that and show you some important components. This is the homepage. You can find the code on uh, GitHub, you can download our, our latest release or you can get started. You can uh, find different examples that may look closer to your application and replace one of the solvers with the one you like. But the first example you may want to uh, run is this quick start. This page uh, is written with the perspective of uh, a new user that has their own laptop where the, it's running Ubuntu and they can actually uh, install some things. Most of our users want to use open phone. So we have here a simple example where we have a channel flow 
And instead of the flexible flap that I showed in the beginning, we have something close enough that can be simulated with a very simple uh, toy solver written in C++. And this is just a rigid body motion solver. Now, you can follow all the steps and uh, install precise, open foam, the open foam adapter, uh, get the examples and build this code. But uh, you don't need to do all this and you don't need to do it today. I will show you a demo for which I will use a demo virtual machine. This is a vagrant box, which is actually a bit more than a virtual machine. And I will be happy to answer questions about this later. And essentially, this is something you can run on Linux, Windows, Mac OS, whatever, and it will start a full Linux environment uh, on your uh, desktop. This is something that you can also SSH to, but let's here use the, the environment. You see here, I have uh, loaded this uh, virtual machine. I can move Windows around. And this is the quick start tutorial. You see here that we have uh, two cases. We have this fluid open foam. This is the flow case. And we also have the solid simulation, the structure with uh, this uh, C++ code. Let's uh, go into this uh, fluid code. And actually, let's uh, just show the files it contains. If you're familiar with open foam, this will look uh, yeah, very familiar. You have a pimple foam setup, and you have here just an additional configuration file in precise dict, which essentially tells, yeah, tells us which patches of open foam to couple and that we want to write forces and read displacements. On the solid side, this looks uh, relatively similar. We just have a C code. And uh, you see here that we also have a precise configuration file. This configures at runtime what kind of data we are coupling, uh, what are the, who is participating in the simulation, what kind of mapping we have, who executes it, uh, what kind of uh, what kind of coupling we have, if it's explicit, implicit, what kind of acceleration methods we have, for example, quasi Newton, and so on. Everything is configured at runtime, and the. Uh, interface of the library remains the same. It's uh, relatively high level in the sense that you don't need to change it for every feature. Other than that, you just see some uh, convenience scripts. Now, how would we start? In this case, we have two participants. So I'm going to split my terminal in two. I'm using here a Terminator and Terminal Emulator that can do that. OK, let's go to Fluid Open Foam. And these are the files I have. And let's go here to solid CPP. And this is, these are the files that I have. Instead of starting open foam uh, manually, like making the mesh and starting the code, uh, I have just made this run script to not have to type everything. But this is just starting an open foam simulation. What you see here is that open foam has started. And uh, it has loaded precise version 2. Point three. This is not the latest, but this is also a great question for the end on why this is not the latest at the moment in this virtual machine. And uh, it is looking for a configuration file in the parent directory. So this needs to be at a common um, directory, essentially, or at least by common practice. And uh, it tells us that it is participant fluid, and it is waiting for the other side to appear. We may have not even compiled or decided what the other solver is going to be. In this case, we have decided it's our C++ solid <laughs> solver. And I'm going to also start this. And you see here what is happening is that while the one solver is simulating, the other is waiting, and then the other one is simulating, and so on. Uh, this is a serial implicit coupling scheme. It is also iterating again and again. Now, to save some time, even though this should not take long, I'm going to cancel this and directly show you the results. I have loaded here in Paraview uh, the, the case. 
we have here this flow simulation. And here we have where the gap is, we have our structure simulation. We are doing here fluid structure interaction with a technique called arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian, which essentially means that we are not going to change the mesh. We are only going to stretch and squeeze the uh, cell, the cells of the mesh. We have an additional field called displacement. And if we visualize here the velocity, you see here that the flow is developing until some oscillations start appearing. And after the oscillations start appearing, some force is exerted on the fluid. And this rod moves up. And eventually, it will start moving down. And so on. So this is how we do fluid structure interaction simulations. And the beauty of it is that we can actually uh, exchange the fluid and the structure solver with anything else we may want without the one solver knowing anything about the other solver, apart from what kind of fields they are exchanging. All right. So I'm going to stop this now and return on my slides. This is the demo that I showed you. And it would make me very happy if you would also run it yourselves, yourself and send me an email uh, with questions or some screenshot with your results. I would still like to um, show you a few things on the website because I have told you what this is. I think I've caught your attention in its potential, but I now want to show you that it can do more than fluid structure interaction. And I also want to support my claim that we have actually built something that people are using nowadays. First of all, um, if you want to, to couple your code, you can find already here some uh, documentation that goes step by step into the code that I told you. Many people have followed this procedure for their codes, or they have used some of our solvers, some of our adapters to couple existing solvers. You can find here a dedicated section on our website regarding the community. And you see here a relatively short list of community stories uh, compared to how many users we actually know. So if you have used Precise in the past, please uh, send us a short text. We will be very happy to advertise your work here. Here you see, for example, again, fluid structure interaction with rotating bodies. This is a, a cycloidal rotor or fluid structure interaction. But then you see uh, a simulation that is actually coupling uh, a muscle system where you have the muscle tenons and you also have the muscle belly and you're coupling it with uh, an electrophysiological mo model. You also see here some acoustics, you see some coupling of, uh, uh, yeah, subsurface flow uh, solver. This is Pflotron with uh, a code that tries to optimize where you put heat pumps in the city of Munich. People have also used this for, um, yeah, um, essentially for fracking uh, simulations uh, and other porous media. Well, we have also used it and we try to extend precise to be able to couple solvers of different dimensions. Most of the users are from the industry, from academia, but we also have some users from the industry. And here you see um, one such contribution where they integrated precise into a complete uh, graphical interface with other solvers. And let me now uh, return to the home page, where at the bottom you can find uh, a few more uh, hints on who is currently using Precise. Uh, we estimate the current number to around maybe 100 groups or more. Uh, most of them are universities, 
mostly in uh, Germany and Europe. We know of some institutes uh, in the US. And yeah, there are also a couple of industrial users. Now, I hope I've caught your attention to the fact that yes, this is something that people are using. This is not just a code that uh, is used inside one research group. And yeah, this is something that uh, we actually really want. Now, since many people have uh, used Precise, you may think that we had already many collaborations. This is partially true because we know of many users that actually, yeah, just appeared through a publication or a poster in a conference. And apparently they were using Precise without us knowing anything about it. So I would claim here that you don't need to talk to us to successfully use Precise. And if you think of it, this is actually an achievement. Often you go to conferences and you see very nice results, uh, but then people rarely talk about the software itself. And if you try to reproduce the results, you contact the author and they have to sit with you through some sessions on actually installing the software and helping you actually use it then maybe for your application. We try to make this as open as possible. And uh, we try to enrich our documentation as much as possible because this is also what we are using. However, it's not only the documentation. Sometimes you want to contact us. And we have also built a nice uh, set of community channels. So I would also claim that if you want, you can actually reach us very easily. You don't need to find out who is actually developing and send emails to the developers. Uh, but you can, for example, write on our forum. And something that uh, made us very, very happy at some point was a user writing on our forum that after the amount of support I have received from this community, I'm switching to open source for every one of my needs. And essentially this sends a message that developing open source software and making it nice, not only makes the software itself nice, but also improves the reputation of open source software as a whole. And uh, this is now a good time to get some questions if there are any. Actually, uh, hi, Erasmus. There is one here. Actually, the uh, participants typing. Let's see if I can, <laughs> real time. So uh, let's see. Okay, I can read the, I can you can read read the question. It. Good, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, can you compare Precise to previous efforts in coupling libraries, such as Fraunhofer's MPCCI or the coupling libraries used in the climate community? That's a very good question. So MPCCI uh, predates Precise, this is clear. And uh, as far as I know, it's a proprietary code. It's not uh, developed in the open. Uh, even though some components, for example, the OpenFOAM adapter is released as GPL software. So Precise does not use any central component. There is no, no server or so. Uh, they also have, I think, a wide uh, ecosystem of supported solvers. Uh, but um, yeah, the main advantage of Precise, I think, is really the, the open ecosystem, the documentation, the community, as well as the advanced algorithms that we offer nowadays, such as the, yeah, the quasi-Newton acceleration, the RBF mapping, and many features that we are developing now. And you can even see our roadmap uh, in the open. So we develop everything really uh, publicly on GitHub, and we even document what, we are, what is going to come next. Uh, if I could compare it to coupling libraries used in the climate community, uh, this is also a very good question because people traditionally thought that precise was only for fluid structure interaction, but this is not the case. Essentially, you can couple any code that you can uh, bring on a mesh. You, you, can, you can get points from the one solver and you want to bring the information from these points to some points of another solver. 
Um, so you can also use it to, uh, to breed macro and micro scales, for example, even though there are tools that um, more traditionally follow that approach, but precise is much more than, uh, than fluid structure interaction and can be applied in other applications. All right, but uh, since there are no uh, questions now, I see someone typing, we can take it next. I would have a question that is, okay, um, nice talking about all these things and nice developing uh, documentation and so on, but why are you even bothering? Why are you doing all this effort? And yes, it's a lot of effort and we are usually not paid exactly to develop precise. We are paid to do uh, some other projects and most of us are doing our PhDs. So why do we actually need users? Well, in our research, we are mostly dealing with methods and software, but we do need users that will actually apply these methods and software to the shiny applications. And only then, first of all, we know that things are working and only then we give value to our research. Uh, through this process, collaboration starts. Through this process, we can get more funding to keep developing our methods and software. All right, so we started from uh, a library that was already very good, very strong. And we are now have an even stronger library that is used by, by many people. And alongside that, we have a rich ecosystem of supported solvers, as well as the documentation and everything else. We have done some things that um, we, we realized that they were not the best decisions and we have corrected them later. And we have learned a lot in the process on what was effective and what not. So I would like here to talk about some, some lessons learned. First of all, some technical aspects. As I said, Precise is a library, meaning that you don't have to adapt your code to fit some coupling framework, but you have your code and you just call a few additional lines of code, similar to how you would call MPI or you would call a plotting library. It is much easier to adopt a library in your code. Then in the complete development, we have separated the concerns, meaning that the library is developed in a separate repository than all the adapters and all the language bindings and so on. This has the great advantage that you can give projects to students, for example. Uh, they can work on it on their own time. Uh, there is no risk involved. And only when something is ready, you can integrate it. You don't need to have a branch uh, dangling somewhere in the repository. You just have a completely different project that can be uh, plugged in at runtime. Something we have improved is that we have made our dependencies uh, a lot fewer, and we try to stick to as common dependencies as possible. We don't want anything exotic. Uh, right now, we have some build-time dependencies such as Eigen, this is very common, and we have a few uh, dependencies also at link time, um, this is also NPI, Petsy, and so on. But these are uh, also optional dependencies. You can switch them off because they only concern specific features. And when a user just wants to do a simple simulation on a laptop, they don't need that. They don't need to uh, try to install all these additional packages. Then uh, for, yeah, our common user that it's, often a PhD student that just started their PhD. Um, they don't want to build code from scratch. What they actually need is to apply it in an application. So we try to make every step easier. For example, we give packages for common platforms, for example, for Ubuntu. And you see, we have all this uh, uh, complex setup of building a multi-physics simulation. We have so many components so reducing the effort just a bit in every component really pays off. 
in the user experience. Then on the technical side, we try to adhere to many uh, guidelines of standard practices. You know, of course, here in this community, the Extreme Scale Development Toolkit. Precise is now a full member of that. And you can also um, find out the policies that we have implemented. Then there is the open source uh, security foundation best practices. This concerns not so much the scientific projects, but it also applies to us. And uh, it has different levels. For example, you can get a basic level certificate just by essentially making up your mind on uh, do I have version control? Is everything developed uh, in public? Can people just follow some documentation to install the software? So this is really good if you're just starting. And of course, we have several linters and code quality checkers that can tell us, for example, if we have parts of untested code. Another aspect is the documentation. And something that did not work well for us in the past was that we had uh, documentation scattered in different resources. We had a very basic website, which was essentially a flyer. And it had little value after the first time you read it. We had a GitHub wiki for Precise itself. And then we had different GitHub wikis for the different adapters. And finally, we had the developer's documentation on Doxygen. And often we had links from the one to the other side. This is a very common situation, but this was uh, very distracting. So what we did now was that uh, we made a nice website. And the website itself is in a repository that does not actually contain all the content. A lot of the content is uh, sourced from different repositories. Because this way, you can actually have the content next to the code. You can have the documentation next to the code. A big advantage of that is that you can update the documentation in the same pull request as your code. At the same time, uh, you see our tutorials, for example, are stored in another repository. And what you see on the website is essentially a rendering of the readme file of the tutorials, which means that if you have already cloned the repository of the tutorials, you know how to run them, even if you are on a train without internet connection. Another lesson learned was that people sometimes find issues and want to fix them. And you really want to catch these motivated users. For this reason, we have added an edit me button on the top of every page. And you can click on that. And this will take you to GitHub. This is the only complication that you need to have a GitHub account. Then you can edit the file, uh, which is markdown, so it's very easy. And you can automatically start a pull request, which will be reviewed by one of us. So there is no, no stress that you're doing something wrong. Someone will actually check it. How do we do all this? Um, well, we sat down one day or many days and discussed the structure and how to do it and so on. We have now a website based on GitHub pages. So that's a Jekyll uh, server. I think also uh, in the better scientific software you're running such a, such a system. And it just has uh, some style sheet on top uh, based on, boot on Bootstrap. So there is a bit of JavaScript there. While we do the while we do maintain the content ourselves, uh, we got some help by uh, hiring someone to uh, to build the general uh, style and structure. Then uh, some other things that uh, came with this was that we have a very nice search functionality. For that, we use Algolia, uh, which is also free for open source projects. Uh, we have the possibility to export a complete PDF of the website. This is great if you want to archive the software or if you want to, to really make something citable for the future for a specific version. And for that, we use uh, a tool called Prince. And we even have some basic user analytics, which are actually uh, privacy respecting. So we don't need to adhere to any special um, uh, cookies law because this is already taken care of. 
Then another aspect on the documentation is more philosophical. So imagine that someone asks you something that is currently not in the documentation. Instead of actually writing a long email explaining the issue, you can instead add it first to the documentation and send them a link saying, okay, thank you very much for finding this issue. And um, uh, yes, and then you can just send this uh, documentation. I see in the chat that uh, someone asks if I'm frozen, so please confirm that everything is all right. It looks good here. Okay, thank you. And uh, I really liked the other day looking for the status of my flight at uh, Lufthansa when I read the note on their flight tracker that said, please note, all the flight information displayed is up to date. Our service centers also obtain their information from this flight status feature. And this is something that is a very important strategy because only in this way you make sure that the documentation is up to date, only if users and developers access the same resources. So you, you update it together with the code, you render it on the website, and everybody is looking at the website. Another aspect that we worked a lot lately was building a community and building communication channels. We started with a mailing list, which I think is very common in especially many older projects. But yeah, let's face it, mailing lists do not scale and many of the new users do not really feel um, that the mailing list is for them. They don't, they don't want to bother too many people that will receive this email, for example. This is also a filter, but I would argue that you want uh, even the most hesitant users to ask questions because only this, in this way you discover more, more issues. We also have a chat room. This is on Gitter, but this is a platform that is slowly dying and potentially being replaced by Matrix. And many of you have, may have uh, Slack. The problem there is that you cannot easily search in the past and the discussions are not really in a threaded view always. Uh, I know there are implementations that do this better, but still what it is actually much better is a forum. And then you can ask, should I create a forum on, for example, CFD online? This is a, a popular um, platform in our community. Or should we create something on ourselves? For us, because we wanted more control and we wanted something more modern, we decided to offer our own forum. And we use uh, Discourse for that, which is an open source tool. And it is also offering free hosting for open source soft software projects. And it's really great. It has threaded view, it has a great search. So if you start typing a question that has been asked in the past, you will get suggestions. You can organize um, your topics into like what solvers are used, uh, what category they are in and so on. And we also use it to post some news. So some blog-like functionality to write common questions and answers and even to network people during conferences and workshops. Let me quickly show you how this looks like. This is the, the thread that um, I mentioned before. You can even interact, you can mark what is the solution to your question and so on. All right. Then this is the way the community communicates online, but of course we also have offline um, communication. The best way to meet us is to come to one of our workshops that we are organizing every February. And there we don't only have talks by users and developers, we also offer training, we also ask the community for feedback, we have um, yeah, a World Cafe style discussion where people discuss specific topics on different tables and shuffle around. And uh, we also sit together with users and discuss their problems individually. 
Finally, let's face it, if you need users for your um, project, it is essential that you try to get them. So also talk about the software in conferences and yeah, talk about the software. Another thing that we learned recently was that, um, first of all, people don't like upgrading so often. They want to focus on their application. But at the same time, we are developing new features that, needs to, that need to find their users. So we decided to not do breaking releases. So we went from precise version one to version 0.2 after maybe three or four years. Our goal right now is uh, two to three years minimum. And at the same time, we want to release new features often, but not too often. We had a release cycle of three months. This consumed a lot of work from our side. People were not really upgrading and we decided to just do it every six months. We now actually have um, every six months a release of the library and after three months, a release of other components. So we have this flip-flop strategy. The downstream components, however, can actually be released at any time. There is no restriction there, but if we have breaking uh, releases or new features, we try to synchronize them. And we also build a complete distribution of the ecosystem. That means essentially which versions of each component work together. And we make them in a citable format. So we put them on a Dataverse instance, something like Zenodo. And we try to distribute one or two of these per year. This is the reason that in the virtual machine I showed you, uh, the precise I used was not the latest version. Okay, something that we are still learning now is how to publish about the software. We had our first uh, reference article that most of the publications using Precise nowadays cite. This was in 2016. However, many of the features described there are not exactly the same anymore. New features have added, some uh, things have changed, more applications have been added. And more importantly, since we are uh, in academia, most of the developers now have changed and there is essentially no citations to the people that are actually involved with software in the past years. So we now release the second uh, version two paper. We try to also release reference articles for adapters, as well as for specific features. Uh, for example, you can find papers uh, discussing only the performance of the library. And we also have the distribution that they just talked about. I would now uh, like to slowly start um, fading out. First of all, by saying that you are very warmly invited to our next uh, workshop. This will be in Munich, the dates are fixed. We know that in the winter, uh, there may be some uh, restrictions uh, due to Corona, but we are anyway, always ready to switch to, to an online format. We did it like this uh, twice. You see here a screenshot of the big blue button instance we used um, this year. And we will announce more details in fall when it will be a bit clearer uh, where the situation is heading to. Well, I know this is a lie, but we can only hope. Okay, so finally, a challenge is how to get sustainable funding. We have not learned about this we are uh, trying to find solutions. We have uh, a research-driven project. We develop new methods and they are for a very niche topic. So academic funding will always be important. Uh, maybe there are not even enough uh, industrial users to uh, support this just by industrial funding. And at the same time, you cannot just uh, offer support, you, you really need to develop uh, the methods further. So one thing we have tried and works nicely is that we write research proposals together with users. 
We organize uh, workshops and this can give us uh, a little of money, a little bit of money that is actually more flexible. Uh, so we can also print stickers or things like that. And of course we can work on the website. And the solution that uh, we now have to deal with the growing requests for collaboration and support is that we have a paid support program, meaning that we still support everyone in the same way on the public forum. But if you actually need more reliable day-to-day uh, -day support, you can apply similarly to a software license, you can apply for a support license in your academic proposal. And this way you ensure that uh, the software that you rely upon will uh, still exist in a few years and that you will have support that we, we can actually that can actually make your project more successful. A few things that I have not discussed uh, today is anything about the features, the performance and so on. I've not discussed how we do testing and continuous integration. We wrote a very nice uh, first blog post about that. And there is another one coming about our system tests. I have not discussed how we collaborate and organize our projects and how we do outreach. However, hint here, we are very happy to talk about this in further talks. So if at some point you're looking for speakers, please contact us again. What I discussed today in a large extent is discussed also in our version two reference paper. We were very happy to be able to publish to the Open Research Europe. This is um, an open access journal funded by the European Commission. Also the peer review is completely in the open and now the first version has been approved. We will uh, push a few improvements in the next few uh, weeks or months. And uh, yeah, uh, Osni in the beginning mentioned that uh, I'm involved in the development, but many people are involved in the development. Uh, here with us today uh, is also Frederick Simonis from the same group, also a colleague. Uh, you also see uh, Boris Martin, uh, who is a working student uh, with us in Stuttgart. And uh, other people that you may have met are Benjamin Neckermann, Miriam Schulte, both professors in Stuttgart, as well as Ishan Desai, David Schneider, Karl Davies, uh, Benjamin Rodenberg, and uh, Kursak Yurt. In the center of all this, you see a growing uh, community. I would like to thank very much uh, the funding bodies that have supported Precise over the years. This is mostly uh, German and uh, local or European uh, funding bodies. And I would like once again to refer to other talks in the same webinar series that you may actually uh, find very interesting if you, uh, if you found any of, what, any of the topics that I talked today interesting. Uh, with this, thank you very much. This is where you can find the slides, give me some feedback directly, and give some feedback to the workshop, uh, to the webinar organizers. And this is again a summary of what I have discussed. Please always think of the user. It may be highly beneficial, but uh, this usually needs a few years to show uh, results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerasmus. There are a couple of questions for you there in the Q&A, if you can see them. And... Yes. So a second question uh, by Alfred Tang is, the speaker makes it sound like Precise is plug and play. Yes, I'm still not clear what it is. Is Precise one single package or a collection of adapters for various libraries? Does it need to be compiled with all the libraries in my code? Do I need to modify my code to use Precise? Many questions here, and I completely understand the question. With this, maybe let's go back to the beginning. So you don't need, uh, it, it is not a single package with everything. You can use nothing 
you can use specific packages of it, but what you will always be using is this green box, the library. And you can use this to couple only your in-house codes, for example. You don't need to use any of this. In some cases, for example, in open foam, it is really plug and play because even the lines that you would need to add to your code to communicate with the library, to use the library, are encapsulated uh, inside a plugin interface, an open foam function object. This really means that you do not need to recompile open foam in any way. You only need to load this adapter at runtime, which is another small library that you need to compile. Uh, then, um, is it a collection of adapters for various libraries? It is in the sense that this is the precise ecosystem. So it is the library plus everything else that we have today that we can just cherry pick and couple existing solvers. Do I need to modify my code to use precise? Yes, you need to modify it in this way. You need to add 10, 20, 30 lines of code depending on the language and, the, um, and what exactly you need to couple, but it is really in this range. And the most important is to know your code, not to know precise. It is really easy to, to just add additional uh, lines of code. You don't need to change your data structures. You don't need to change how you call your solver. You just call uh, the solver as you always would. And it is like calling an additional plotting library. Let's say you, you call VDK to write VDK files. I hope that uh, this answers the question. And uh, then there was a comment referring to to the paper. Yes, I, I added that one, the comment. So the ah, question was about, much. it's a follow on to the, the first question. It's related to libraries in, in, uh, for uh, in climate applications. Uh, did, did you add something? No, it's the, the second question. This was a follow. The, the, the participants. Ah, okay, okay, right. I, I missed that. Yes. Uh, follow up on the question about the uh, libraries used in the climate community. In climate coupling libraries, there is always a balance that has to be struck between interpolation accuracy and conservation properties, important for long running simulations. How are you dealing if you are with this? I'm not really familiar with uh, climate simulations, so I hope I understand correctly. Um, the for long running simulations probably means that you accumulate some numerical error. What we do, first of all, for interpolation uh, is that we have different methods that are as simple as just picking your nearest uh, neighbor on the other mesh, which is very fast, but yeah, very inaccurate. Or you can actually uh, build an interpola based on radial basis functions on, um, on the other side. And for that, you can uh, say, I want to use, I want to take the complete mesh into account, or I want to uh, only focus on some region to, to save time. And uh, this way you can really have a very accurate mapping between the meshes. Something that I think is implied here is really the accuracy of the coupling itself. Uh, that is something you can actually really configure. We have this implicit coupling algorithms that iterate and they also can reduce their iterations learning from the past. This is what the quasi-Newton method does. And there you can really set the, uh, the, the, uh, the thresholds you want for uh, convergence. You can say, I want everything that I'm exchanging to have an absolute convergence measure of, I don't know, machine precision, uh, which is something that probably would, would be quite difficult. Uh, but there are methods to, to really achieve higher accuracy. Uh, but everything is configurable. So this is in the end up to the user. 
There is another question uh, at the same time, and I hope I can answer many still. Do the couple codes run on the same threads while one is waiting for the other, or do I need to allocate more cores while submitting a job? For example, 40 cores for CFP and 10 for FEMT, meaning uh, 50 cores in total. Everything is completely MPI parallel. We start in two separated MPI communicators, and uh, every solver can have whatever parallelism it wants inside. Meaning that, yes, if you want to have 40 cores for your flow solver, that is usually the expensive one, and 10 for your structure solver, then yes, uh, you should have 50 cores in total if you want to make sure that uh, every time one, uh, one core is only running one process. Something that I need to mention here is that in the demo, I showed you a serial or staggered scheme where the one code was waiting for the other, but Precise also supports parallel schemes in the Jacobi style um, way, meaning that you can really utilize the full system without having parts of it uh, idling. And that means that the FEM could not use a subset of the CFD course. Um, I think that if you configure it in a serial way, you, you could uh, also allow the FEM to use a subset of the CFD course. But again, um, what you probably really want to do is to have a parallel coupling uh, where you can utilize your full system. But you have the option to do both. Any further questions for Gerasimus? We have, uh, I think, a few minutes left here. So if you would like to add- I see, I see one um, um, question or clarification in the chat that was, uh, conservation properties are on integrated quantities such as opposed to pointwise ones. Uh, yes, we also have interpolation mapping methods uh, that distinguish between mapping, for example, a temperature or a force that really needs to be integrated. Uh, I'm sorry, Osni. No, no problem. So, if, you know, uh, I invite people to unmute and ask directly to, um, um, to Gerasimus if there is any, any other question from the audience. If not, Thank you very much for joining us. And for those of us uh, joining from Europe, have a good evening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gerasimus. Thank you very much, Osni, and have a great day. <laughs>